And I think that's a really big question that actually has to be resolved in this space because we do a lot of legislative work and a lot of that legislative work is actually very radical. In fact, I'm sure MK will talk about VAWA in a minute too, but um, it's still within a federal system. It's still within a colonial system, those changes that we're making. Um, and I do think to some extent we still have to ask ourselves, what, in what ways has the mindset of settler colonialism continued to manifest in the American public's mindset and what are we going to do as Americans to really interrogate that, right, and get at those issues specifically within us? And I think that's a bigger question that has to be resolved. Yeah, and you've often talked about things in popular culture like mascots, yeah. for example. Tell us how that's even related to the MMIP crisis. Oh, mascots irritate me so much. Uh, okay. Um, Yes. All right. So we'll, we'll have to do a deep breath. MK, after. you can probably Dang add girl, to this. Thanks. I'm trying to make this conversational too. But MK can probably add to this as well, and so can Heather. But mascot. I mean, the literal word means pet, right? Um, and why is it that only Native people are mascots? Um, and the time periods in which these mascots are being created are really sort of at turning points within the U.S. history. And and again, speaking to sort of like a pushing off of American Indians, um, or alternatively a dehumanization of them, right? Uh, you can either look at, a, if, you're, if you're looking at us through mascot imagery, you are either placing us squarely in the past, like you're fixing us there, we're not here in the present, so it's okay to do these things, right? Uh, you're stereotyping, you're saying, oh, well, you're a brave, or you're a fighter, or you're a warrior, or you're a chief, or you know, whatever, whatever people say for excuses around that. Um, but it, it really gets to this idea of you're not here anymore. So you don't have a say. And it's totally fine for us to parrot you, to play Indian. Um, and I actually encourage everybody, if you haven't read it, there's a book by, uh, I think, Philip Deloria called Playing Indian, where he talks about playing Indian is actually an ongoing act of genocide itself as well. Um, and so these little things that we think about, like dehumanization, right, or propaganda even, which I kind of consider mascot imagery to be, um, what is that saying about ongoing genocide in the US? Right? We don't see this in other places where they've experienced genocide, where we make mascots out of the people that were killed. I, I don't think that we do, at least, if somebody could point me to an example. But you know, we, we don't do that. So why do we do it here? Why is that, such a, why is that the way of honoring people? Right? If you ask Native people what you can do to honor them, there are so many other ways in which to go about good allyship that doesn't involve caricature and racial trope. So yes. We'll, we'll definitely get to the ally and kinship issues in, uh, in the minutes to come, but I first want to ask Caroline a follow-up question. So I wanna talk a little bit about the specific risks to Native women and other persons who are becoming part of these statistics. What are some of those risks that we're seeing in patterns, and then also some of the consequences so that we can get an idea of really the gravity of the issue of the MMIP crisis. Yeah, I mean, so the consequence is death. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. You know, that, that's the consequence. It's, it's death, it's loss of a very valued person to a community, it's loss of a family member, it's loss of a daughter, a sister, a mother, right? It's loss. Um, that's the consequence. So we just start off right there. Um, but what are the risks? So I always, when I think about MMIW, I think about it in terms of intervention, response, right, and prevention, okay? And so when I think about intervention, I'm talking specifically about the time period maybe in which somebody is reported missing. We have like a limited amount of time, right, in which you could maybe locate them um, and do something that might increase their safety, okay? Response is this person is presumed missing or we've found them deceased, right, and now there has to be a criminal justice response, which is usually the way the Western world likes to orient things, and we have to respond accordingly there. Intervention would be things like, how do we minimize societal risks to groups of people, right? So, you th and you have to think about that from an oppression framework. I think that's really important here. Um, but so it would be something like, how do we maximize public housing, right? How do we make sure that people, when they age out of the foster care system, don't slip through the cracks there? How do we make sure that Native women have support in their communities, that tribal governments are able to exercise their inherent authority to protect their communities? How do we do these things to like bolster protective factors so that we don't get right to a place where somebody is missing or murdered? Because that should be the goal, right? But the risks, I mean, and you can see the risks at each stage. 
if you want to talk about response from a law enforcement response or from the criminal justice response, the risk is that these cases go unprosecuted. And MK can talk all day about that because that's a lot of the work that she does too. Um, the, another risk in that, like say in the intervention stage, is that when you go to file a police report as a, as a native person's uh, family member, you're going to get a bunch of qualifiers, right? You're gonna hear, oh, well, she's probably off with her boyfriend, or oh, she, maybe she's drinking, all the typical racist, right, things that come up in that space. Um, and, and that's problematic because law enforcement should be taking a police report. That's what they should be doing. They shouldn't be qualifying, right, uh, whether or not somebody is worth the resources to look for them. Um, but that's what they're doing. So that's a risk. Um, but when you talk about the prevention places, we don't have the things that we need. I mean, in our communities, we have a lack of culturally uh, developed or peer-to-peer -peer resources. We have a lack of tribal domestic violence shelters. So in the US, um, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. There are fewer than 50 tribal domestic violence shelters. So if you think about the, um, like the just incredible rates of violence that we experience, and then pair that with the absolute lack of places we have to go for safety, that is a risk. Um, mental health and substance use issues are a risk, right? Um, invisibility, dehumanization, sexualization, fetishization, all of these things kind of come into play. Um, but I, you know, I think one of the biggest risks is that we think about tribal governments, right? We being America, not we being myself as a native person, but um, as, as not being able to exercise authority in the way that, you know, uh, Western society wants us to. That itself is inherently racist. Um, tribes are fully capable of protecting due process rights. We do it all the time. Um, I do it as a judge. Um, we are fully capable of keeping our people safe. We know how to keep our people safe. And so the idea that we don't know how to do it, right, that's oppressive. So those are the things I would say. I don't know if you want to add to that. Heather, MK, I keep looking at MK even though she's, if I look behind me, she doesn't see me like that. <laughs> I have questions for MK. All right. <laughs> I did want to get to the mental health issue, and I wanted to talk also about intergenerational and historical trauma. And I wanted Heather maybe to add some insight into this issue because I've heard you talk very eloquently about the issue of historical trauma and how that affects Native peoples in relation to this crisis. I don't know if I'll be so eloquent now. <laughs> Um, okay, so historical trauma is trauma that is carried down from generation to generation. There have been actual scientific studies done on not just indigenous peoples, but also those who were Holocaust survivors. There's something that changes within us in our DNA, and it's passed down. And when it comes to historical trauma, um, for indigenous people, I tend to focus on the historical trauma that comes um, from boarding school survivors. You know, I am the granddaughter and great-granddaughter of boarding school survivors. My great-grandparents went to Carlisle. My grandparents went to uh, boarding school um, in northeastern Wisconsin. And so um, I carry that with me. Um, and it's, it can be a blessing and a curse, right? It can be a blessing because they survived and I'm here because of that. It can be a curse because sometimes you're not sure what to do with those feelings. You don't know, like, is this, we this is weird, why am I feeling this way? Um, but it definitely, I think, plays a role. So when Caroline was talking about how it affects our communities, historically, we did not live on reservations, all right? That was something that was forced upon us. And our way of life changed the minute we were on those reservations. So nomadic tribes were no longer nomadic. They weren't traveling, you were stuck. You couldn't leave without a day pass. You had to come back. It's like when you're in school and you had to go to the restroom and you had to ask your teacher, you had to get a pass. It was the same for leaving a reservation. So our way of life changed, our culture changed, our traditions changed. Our warriors weren't out there anymore doing their warrior work, right? They were stuck in these reservations. So where does that anger go? Where does that trauma go? What are you supposed to do with it? It continues to be passed down to generation to generation. We do have the ability to break that cycle. But in order to break that cycle, we have to understand it. And we have to understand the role that colonization plays in that as well. So yeah, it's difficult. And specifically for those who are at risk or vulnerable to MMIP 
crisis, you know, violence and discrimination, how does intergenerational trauma manifest in individuals? Well, I think it speaks to what Caroline said earlier about how black and brown bodies are looked at as easily invadable, right? So you carry that with you. You look, I mean, I myself have personally thought of myself as not worthy, unlovable. We're getting real deep here, you guys. I'm in therapy, it's fine. Um, so, you know, if ha you've had those thoughts. So if you carry those thoughts with you, then why are you important? Why should you be protected? It puts you at risk more if you don't understand those thoughts and try to uh, deal with them in a way that is healthy, hopefully culturally healthy. You know, there are processes you can go through um, that help, you know, deal with those feelings because it's hard when you go through life thinking you're not worthy to understand that you are and that you're worth protecting because you're someone's mother, daughter, sister. At the end of the day, you're a person and you have dignity and you deserve that dignity. Thank you. I was looking for that word dignity because you often you. speak of that. <laughs> so thank you for that. So I now want to turn to our guests on the big screen. Mary Catherine, first, I want to uh, ask you a question. And I want you to talk to us a little bit about what is happening to individuals, communities, and to families, especially when a loved one goes missing or is murdered. What does the process of justice and accountability or lack thereof actually look like? Um, great. Well, thank you all so much for allowing me to be here tonight. It's really a pleasure. And I apologize that I can't be there in person, but it's so nice to see you all. And, and Gloria, it's good to see you again. Um, <laughs> You know, it, I, I, I'm going to answer that question in a second, but I just want to say that while we were sitting here, um, I got an email invitation to the White House on Wednesday for the signing of the Violence Against Women Act, and I just want us all to recognize that <laughs> this is a really important moment that we're sitting right now. Uh, this Wednesday, the President of the United States is going to sign into law an act that will restore tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian crimes of stranger sexual assault, which is not something tribes have had criminal jurisdiction over since 1978, human trafficking, uh, child abuse, you know, assault on our law enforcement who protects our women and children. And so it's, it's really, really a historic time to see the United States taking these steps to restore what has historically been taken away. And uh, there's just really no question that what, uh, when President Biden signs this into law, this will go a long ways towards addressing the MMIP crisis. It won't be a complete or full solution, and it certainly isn't the full Oliphant fix, but it is a major, major step forward, one that for many of us here on, on this panel tonight, we've been working on for the last four years and, and all the generations before us. So um, it's really, really, uh, I think, just absolutely monumental. I think we all thought it would, well, it was a hard fight. I don't know. I think, <laughs> I thought, I think we thought we'd still be fighting right now. Um, but instead, we have a little chance to celebrate and then a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to implement this. But, uh, you know, what can families expect? Well, unfortunately, again, um, you know, this, this law will, will make a difference. But for the most part, um, tribal nations do not have criminal jurisdiction over non Indians when they come onto tribal lands and murder Native women or children. Now, if they are in a domestic relationship, then that's domestic violence, and the tribe will have criminal jurisdiction over that under the restored jurisdiction from VAWA 2013. But aside from that, um, many of the homicides of our Native people, uh, brothers, sisters, two-spirit relatives, are usually outside, not always. But in fact, we have a high rate of, of homicide within intimate partner relationships as well. But, but for those uh, homicides outside of that, there's no tribal jurisdiction if it's, if it's perpetrated by a non-Indian. And the U.S. Department of Justice has produced statistics showing that the majority of Native people who have been victimized by violent crime have been victimized by non-Indian perpetrators. So we know the prevalence of non-Indian crime is high. And so this jurisdictional gap is very much a problem. Um, I think, what does it mean for our family members? Well, it means that in most instances, when they're living within their own home on their reservation, 
if they have a loved one who's been murdered, they're looking to the FBI to investigate because the FBI is the only law enforcement agency with actual criminal jurisdiction, again, because of the decision in all of them that I just mentioned and that was mentioned earlier. What happens uh, when you call the FBI? If you are a Native person calling the FBI, they most likely will not talk to you. If they do engage, they are probably going to say something that's patronizing and dehumanizing in, one of the, in, in the moment in your life when you are suffering one of the greatest losses you will ever suffer. I have tried to contact the FBI on behalf of um, the families that I represent, and I will tell you that they have been abusive and rude to me, and thank God I'm not the family member, but I think they would say the same things to my family members that I represent. Uh, it's very problematic, and I think it's very systemic. It's not just one FBI office in Indian country. It is pervasive through all of Indian country. And I think all you have to do is look at the reaction to Gabby Castillo's death and compare that to any of the families that I work with, where they can't even get an FBI agent to undertake an actual investigation. Um, no investigation is taken. Um, the crime scene is not preserved. Eyewitness interviews are not taken. Uh, nothing is taken seriously. And then there's no communication with the family. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is devastating. And for the families, it is very traumatizing. Um, you've lost a loved one, but now the law enforcement agency that has a federal trust duty and responsibility to protect and safeguard the lives of our Native people living on Native land is turning its back on you and maybe even saying things that are, are dehumanizing to you about your loved one who was murdered. Um, just one example, I represent the family of Lindsay Whiteman who was murdered on the Blackfeet Reservation a couple years ago. Um, still no justice for her family, still no investigation from the FBI. Um, two years after she was murdered, about two years, one year, one or two years after she was murdered, uh, the FBI office came by her brother's work, workplace where he was working, walked into the workplace and just handed him a bag and said, here are the clothes your sister was wearing the day she died and don't you, don't worry anymore, the case is closed, we're not investigating any further. Several, every, everyone in the community knows who murdered Lindsay Whiteman. In fact, um, the one of one of the two killers, there were two killers that were in, working in tandem. One of them later went and got arrested by the state authorities because off the Blackfeet Reservation, he uh, did an armed burglary, burglary, I can never pronounce that word, and got arrested for that crime and prosecuted for that crime and sent to jail for that crime by the state of Montana. Um, but the two individuals who murdered Lindsay Whiteman uh, and Amy Whitegrass, that was also there with her that day, have never been um, prosecuted or charged with, with the, their murders. And the FBI just simply returned Lindsay's clothing to her brother saying, we're done. So as you can imagine, it's incredibly devastating for our families to have law enforcement completely ignore these crimes. Thank you, MK. And Heather, you also have spoken about the issue of the non-response of the FBI and thinking about how the FBI and other law enforcement agents respond to non-native um, you know, violence, violence against non-native women especially. So I wanted to know if you wanted to also offer some insight into that. Yeah, so um, MK alluded to it, but uh, oh my god, I can't even think of when it was. It was last year, right, when Gabby Petito went missing. Um, and I had already done a talk on MMIW. I had one all put together. But when she went missing, I decided I was going to revamp that talk because there was something that struck me about her case that I didn't see happening with MMIW cases. Now, this is a disclaimer. Her case was tragic because there was a life that was lost. It's absolutely tragic. But from the time that she was reported missing to the time that her remains were found was eight days. It was only eight days from time of report to time of recovery. There are women in Indian country who have been missing for decades, years, months, a long, long time. And they get nothing in return. MK explained that better than I could explain it. There's no response. But a young white girl goes missing and the whole country loses her. The whole country responds. The whole country is out there trying to find her. They feel like they've lost her. But one of my sisters, my aunties, my grandma go missing, it's nothing. There's no response. 
you won't ever see her name in the news. And if you do, there's some sort of victim blaming that happens. She was out late. She was wearing too short of a skirt. She was at the casino. She was drinking. But Gabby went missing, and the whole nation came together. Everybody came together. And tragically, she was not found alive, but she was found in eight days. In the same area where over 700 indigenous women were missing. Same area, but we don't know their names. They're nameless in this. So it's the lack of response is alarming. And it's not that that case was not tragic, it was. But let's think about that. Why was her case so important and the cases in our communities are not. Like, what, why is it that way? Yeah, you know, I, you just made me think of something, too, and MKU as well, but, like, when somebody passes, right, when they die, you get some sense of healing, some sense of resolve, right, from, from their physical body and you being able to put that body into whatever, whatever practice you do around, you know, ceremony or uh, funeral rites, right? There's, that's supposed to be a sense of closure. Um, and so when these cases go uninvestigated, when people do not go looking, when we do not find, right, which is often the case, not only is a family left with right, a, an, a massive void that they cannot fill, they also are left with absolutely zero closure about what happened. And I want to point that out because I think that's really relevant. Uh, in Gabby Petito's case, her, her family got, at the very least, some closure relatively quickly. She was in, and she was found in a very remote, right? Area. Very remote, and people, yeah. That's kind of another thing that gets thrown out. Oh, well, you know, a lot of places in Indian country, it's, it's very remote, it's rough terrain, it's geographically uh, challenging, right, for law enforcement. Uh, maybe we only have two tribal police officers who have to cover the area of Rhode Island. Um, but in her case, like, all of a sudden, all of these agencies figured out very quickly how to work together they figured out very quickly, right, how, how to locate at the very least. Um, and that brought her family a sense of peace. A lot of, a lot of families in our communities don't have that peace. And they don't get that closure from being able to put somebody into the ground or from being able to just be reunited. It's the same thing with the boarding school issue. I mean, there's a connection there too, thinking about all of the children that we're finding in mass graves. That's not just gonna be in Canada, that's very much going to be also in the United States. And I heard what you were saying, I wanted to like give you a little rub when you were talking about, because my grandfather was also a boarding school survivor, as was his mother, as was her mother um, and her sisters. Um, and I, that's, that's a painful thing to talk about. But I get to talk about it because my grandfather came home. A lot of our children are in mass graves in these institutions all across the United States and have, let to, have yet to be repatriated back to their communities. Um, and that's, again, it's just like another example of how this sort of manifests in a lot of different ways. And how the history and the cycle of violence continues. So MK, you kind of preempted me a little bit, but I do wanna back us up just a tiny bit because I think the audience could really benefit from hearing from you a little more about the quote unquote Oliphant fix. So what exactly does that mean? What is the relationship between MMIP and the Supreme Court's decision in Oliphant, which now is still law of the land, but maybe now is much less uh, a piece of, of this issue and problem now that VAWA has passed? So maybe you can talk about that case, what that means for Indian country, and then what exactly VAWA, you, you talked a little bit about the specifics of who it now protects, but maybe who it still doesn't protect. Sure, so, um, I, I mean, I think until all font is fully reversed, whether that is legislatively or through the Supreme Court's decision to reverse itself, Native people will continue to be victimized at higher rates than any other population. And why is that? Well, it's just common sense. If the sovereign government closest to a person cannot protect that person, that person is extremely vulnerable. Imagine if the Supreme Court issued a decision saying, you know what, Kansas, we don't think you should be able to criminally prosecute anyone who comes into your land but is a citizen of a separate state. So if a citizen of Nebraska comes into Kansas because you don't let them vote in your election, you can't prosecute them when they commit crimes on your land. That sounds outrageous to most of us, and I think we would say, that's crazy. That means that like Ted Bundy's killing spree 
he could have totally gotten away with it because Colorado couldn't have prosecuted him, or Florida, because he wasn't citizens of those states when he murdered those women there. We would never allow for that, but we allow the Supreme Court to say that to tribes, that you, tribes, cannot prosecute people who aren't citizens of your nation when they come onto your land and kill and rape and murder your women. And so until we change that whole apparatus, right, there's always going to be a walking bullseye on our Native women, children, and relatives. And so we have to address all this one. The VAWA that President Biden will, Biden will sign into law on Wednesday goes a long way towards addressing that. It's an ama amazing accomplishment. Um, it doesn't get us all the way. And I apologize, my dog is now barking in the background. Of course, he's decided that now is when he needs to come inside the house. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, I think what else do we have to do? You know, we will continue to work on reversing all the font because it is one of the most unjust decisions that the United States Supreme Court has ever issued. And if you read the decision, you understand that it doesn't have any doctrinal foundation that holds up today. One of the main cases that the Supreme Court cited in this 1978 decision is Johnson v. McIntosh which is an 1823 decision saying tribes cannot claim legal title to their lands. Why? Because we're racially inferior savages and heathens. And that language is actually in the court case. The case has never been overturned. In fact, was cited by Chief Justice Rehnquist in Oliphant in 1978. And so Oliphant just has to go. It needs to go. And I think uh, we're seeing that Congress is working on chipping away at it. And I think that once we have fully chipped away at it, you ask what's left. Well, for instance, homicide still, right, is not in, in VAWA 2022. It's not in VAWA 2013. So non-Indians can still walk onto tribal lands and commit homicide so long as it's outside the context of an intimate partner relationship. Um, so it can't be domestic violence. And that will still remain a, a crime that tribal nations cannot prosecute when perpetrated by non-Indians. And so I just like to give that example because I think if you told you know, people living in Texas that their own state government can't protect them if someone from Oklahoma comes into their home and murders them, they would lose their mind. That would just drive people crazy. Thanks, MK. I want to remind everyone here in the audience, and I think on Zoom as well, that you can write down questions and hand them in to, uh, you know, have them asked by me uh, during the Q&A portion of, of the of the event. Um, so before I do open it up, I want to bring Gloria into the conversation as well. So we do talk a lot about allies. Well, our working group has changed that term to kin and kinship ties and thinking about how we can be better kin because it, it has a connotation of caring that we really need to have in our community to address this issue and crisis in its for all of its facets. And so I want to ask you, Gloria, if you can talk to us about our societal responsibility in not only perpetuating this violence, but also our power and our privilege to prevent such crises from further devastating Native communities across the country. I wanna know how you became involved in this activist arena on these issues and can you give all of us who are kin, who want to see an end to this crisis of MMIP, ways in which we can positively contribute to solutions? Thank you. I think you can get involved and impassioned in all kinds of ways. I mean, for instance, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, I was coming home from the airport and there was a big graffiti above the highway that somebody had got up there and painted, and it said, Wheels Over Indian Trail. All right. That, you know, was uh, one of the beginnings for me, because I'm sorry to say my college education did not include this, of what I think of as vertical history. You know, it, I think it's quite intimate to say, okay, what was the beginning of human history and the length of human history that I have not been taught, and it is on the land where I am standing. It, it, it tells you how incomplete our education is. Uh, it does have an intimacy. There is nothing like storytelling to learn this. Our brains, the human brain, is organized on storytelling and on narrative, and not on just facts 
and, and uh, you know, historical names. So our curiosity is a revolutionary weapon. And the great gift of this program, and everyone who has spoken up to now, is that it will have excited the imagination, the curiosity, the anger of people who were listening or sitting in the auditorium and participating who may not have known something that they just heard. I'm so grateful <laughs> for your uh, putting on this, this program. And, you know, it just um, is a, an infinite gift uh, to all of us to make the path visible so that we as individuals, whoever we are, whatever our race or class or gender, whatever it is, so we too are visible. It is, history is a revolutionary weapon, as, you know, many historians have have told us, but we have not ourselves mostly enacted in our own school courses, in our own college courses, about the land we are standing on. So I hope that, um, you know, <laughs> people who are listening, people who are sitting in the audience are mad as hell, you know, at, at what they don't know and what they've been deprived of and what therefore becomes replicated as an injustice because it has allowed to become invisible. I thank you so much for this program and I thank everybody who's listening. Thank you, Gloria. Go ahead. <laughs> and thank you so much for giving your voice to this really important cause as well. And you know, also what I, here when I'm listening to Gloria is, you know, getting mad as hell is really important. And if you're feeling uncomfortable, that's also a feeling to sit with. I know that, you know, the first 10, 20, 30 times that I listened to, really listened about this issue and thought about settler colonial violence and thought about how it perpetuates to today, I think about the fact that it really hurts all of us, that we're all suffering from colonial violence and we really need to all come together and the oppressive you know origins of this particular crisis manifests itself in this crisis but in so many other crises that we see uh, happening right now in our communities and COVID-19 has exacerbated that and really made some of these invisible invisible oppressions much more visible so any thoughts about specific acts you talked about education, Gloria, about a vertical history of understanding where, whose land you're on and, and where the history brings us to the present. And even thinking about curriculum and other particular concrete things that we can be doing in our own local communities. Is there anything else, and I'll open this up to everyone on the on the panel as well, is there anything else that you would say are specific acts, things that we can do to really combat this, this crisis? Well, I mean, I would just say do whatever we can. You know, I mean, if we are teachers, we can make sure this is part of the curriculum. If we are uh, readers and distributors of books in any way, we can make, clear, make that information available. Um, I, as a journalist and a filmmaker, once made years ago, or helped to make a, a documentary about violence against Native Canadian women, which was you know, much the same story, which educated me and I hope educated other people. It, the, the important thing is to make it part of our everyday, daily life possibility, activism, and consciousness. MK, thoughts? Yeah, I, I love that answer because I think that everyone, there, there is no one thing that will solve the problem. We all have to do what we can. And I think one thing too is never forget that how you vote has a really powerful effect, um, especially in local elections and a lot of places, um, even you know, right next to border towns, the reservations, urban areas, you know, are the individuals that we're electing to these local state positions 
Do they care when Native women are murdered? Do they investigate? Um, we've got sheriffs all over the country that do not investigate the murders of Native women when they're in their jurisdiction. And I think those people, we need to make sure they're not reelected, right? And we need to elect people on the local level who will take these homicides and these crimes seriously. I'm talking about off-reservation land. And in terms of on-reservation land, you know, we've, I think we've got to find a way, and I don't know what the real solution is to this, we've got to find a way to hold the FBI accountable. They are not being held accountable to the murder, for the murders of Native women on their watch that they're not investigating. And I don't know what the exact political solution is because we don't elect the FBI, but I think we've got to just continue to find ways to advocate with this current administration, the President Biden administration, because he's put out an executive order on this. He's made very clear he cares about this issue. And so we've got to find ways to work with this administration to address, I would say, the prejudice at FBI um, when it comes to, and some of it's lack of resources, let's be honest. It's not just, um, you know, the, the, the FBI has a hard time in Indian country because, for instance, in Montana, I think they have one Indian agent assigned to all of Indian country in Montana, and you've got several very, very large reservations. So, you know, it's also uh, inadequate resources being allocated by the federal government to the FBI. Um, but we've got to advocate for, for that to change with this administration in a way that will compel them to take action. You know, I don't know if this is such a practical uh, <laughs> suggestion, but during, in the Vietnam era and in other situations, we organized thousands and thousands of people to take from their income tax the amount of money they thought should be attributed to something else and basically said, I'm not paying this, come and get me. And it, it cost the IRS so much to, you know, <laughs> uh, whatever they were. Uh, the uh, MMIP it, tax. It, it, it takes a minimum of a couple thousand people to do that, but it's not that hard to organize. And then give that money to the organizations that need it. I love that idea. <laughs> I love that idea. Uh, well, let's think about that, because I think we have a lot of people who might be willing to do that. <laughs> yes, and I have some students who have energy to organize around that. So <laughs> what about Heather, Caroline? Thoughts about action? I'll go first. <laughs> um, you know, I, I am a historian. I am an educator. I am all about learning. And one thing that I think that we need to do, and it's a big debate here in this country right now, is speak truth to our history. We don't do it, right? I say speak truth to our history. Some people call it critical race theory. It's the same thing. Um, um, but truth to history kind of like people go, oh, what is that? And I'm like, duh, it's what everyone's debating about. It's important. I don't think we, we do that. We don't like to look at the dark. We don't like to look at the bad and the ugly. We don't like to you know, accept the fact that we are a country that was born on genocide, that was then later built on the backs of enslaved people. We don't like to talk about that because it's icky, okay? And people don't like to talk about things that are icky. We don't like to talk about um, that, the fact that in the Declaration of Independence, which I do think was a really good breakup letter, refers to us as merciless Indian savages, right? We don't talk about that. We don't talk about Washington's policies or Jefferson's policies or any of those policies because they're the founding fathers of this great country. But we need to. We need to realize that they are flawed men, people, who were just, who did extraordinary things, but they were flawed. We have to speak truth to history. We have to talk about the genocide. We have to talk about slavery, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, um, all of that stuff in order for us to be able to move forward and to stop making these same damn mistakes over and over and over again. I am so tired of turning on the news and seeing something that I saw happen in my history book because we didn't learn from it the first time. So education to me is so key. Being open to that education, reading, watching documentaries, and then telling somebody about them because that is how the word will spread because clearly we're not doing it 
but shout out to all your teachers because you're doing an amazing job with like little to no resources. But I get that your hands are tied because people don't want to learn that truth. So I, that education, that would be my solution. So, um, so one thing I would say, so I co-sign all of that, like everything that everybody has said. Um, I also really love to swivel in this chair. Um, <laughs> so so uh, first thing, survivors and their families need flexible funding. Um, so this is not like, a, I'm not calling on like specific legislation for this. I'm just saying directly, right, that there's a lot of amazing grassroots organizations. Their primary function is to get cash into the hands of the people that need it. And the beautiful thing about that funding is it's unrestricted. So if a survivor needs it for her first or last month's rent, guess that's fine. There's no conditions on it. Uh, if a survivor needs it for childcare or if a survivor needs it for bail money, that's totally fine, right? So, so I think direct funds, even if it's a little amount, it actually goes a long, long way. And you know, Gloria is, are, is obviously talking right about important collective action. And I think that that's really important. Is like we are, if we are going to be in good kinship with one another, right? There has to be a recognition that with that kinship comes actually a lot of power. It comes a consolidation of power and a shifting of power. Um, and sometimes that makes us feel uncomfortable, and we have to ask ourselves why that makes us uncomfortable and do a little interrogating there. Um, but if we can just sort of like do some little, they, they, it seems like little action, but altogether it's really, really not. And I do think that there are a ton of people who are already doing this work. And if you go and check out their websites, like uh, the organization, um, the Sovereign Bodies organization, right? Um, there's NIWRC where I work. There's UIHC, uh, Urban Indian Health. There's a ton of tribal coalitions. There's a Strong Hearts Native Helpline, right? All of these really amazing organizations doing this work. Just learn about them, reach out to them, see how you can support them. I also am a firm believer that everybody has a gift. Um, and that's part of our teachings. So your gift might be that you are just really good at sending the doodle poll. And nobody is good at sending the doodle poll. So that is actually, right, like a huge thing that you can do to support people. Your gift might be that you're a lawyer, right? Great. Figure out how you can do direct action there. Your gift might be that you're um, in the media. Your gift might be that you are a singer or a poet or an artist, right? But you have something to bring to the movement too. And I think finding out what that is and making sure that you're contributing it in a respectful, helpful, useful way uh, is, is another action that you can do. Thank you. Okay, so I have some questions from the audience. And so I want to ask these questions. And Joel, wherever you are, just cut me off when we have no more time. So the first, and I am seeing this problem, whoever is asking this question, it is a very important question, not only for the US, it's a very important question here in the United States, but also throughout the Americas. So when you're thinking about the fossil fuel industry, also think about who is investing in fossil fuels and other extractives, because all across the world, but especially in the Americas, there is a land and resource grab that is happening, happening right under our noses, and it is extremely serious. And those on the front line are indigenous populations, communities, and individuals that are suffering from this crisis. So the question is about discussing how fossil fuel industry, the fossil fuel industry, is literally paying for law enforcement. So through security, I'm assuming, to protect their infrastructure, so their equipment and other things that they, they need protection from who knows what, um, how that contributes to the lack of investigation of the MMIP crisis. I, I, can, I can start in so many ways, truly, um, all the ways, actually. So the first would be the mindset that it takes to think, um, I should extrapolate everything, right? Um, and land should be put towards its best use as defined by Western society. That's a problem in our thinking. Um, we don't think of land as a being, we don't think of land as a relative, and we violate it in that way, right? For our own personal use and consumption. So that's the first thing that I think is really important. Second thing is to think about who comes, right, to pipelines to work. It's a transient, cash-rich, male group of people, right? And that's the truth. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else I can say it, actually. And they're there, and it's 
right? It's, it's a lot of work and it's, it's a lot of nothing else, um, unfortunately, and there's absolutely zero accountability for them. A lot of times because of what MK was discussing, they're non-Indian and they're usually on Indian lands because what lands do we like to give oil and gas leases to? Indian land, right? Um, and that's, again, thinking about settler colonialism, like, like this is where you would want to go look at the Dawes Act, um, has just historically been ongoing since colonization started. Um, and it still happens. It happened with Standing Rock, it happened with Keystone Pipeline, right? It, it happens every day, actually. Um, so I think it's, it's thinking about a lot of those things. So the fossil fuel industry has a huge impact. And if you, there's a, there was a study about the Bakken oil region that, that showed you just how exponentially high the rates of violence rose during the time in which the industry was there, uh, and specifically against Native women. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> you know, I will just say um, it's an important thing to think about. Today, the Eighth Circuit issued a decision in a case called Mitchell versus Kirchmeier. And uh, I actually authored a brief that we filed in that case on behalf of the National Congress of American Indians. It's a case where one of the water protectors who was at Standing Rock, who was peacefully protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline, was uh, actually almost killed and very tragically wounded by Morton County law enforcement who started shooting these really tough, um, weighty bean bags, which sound maybe not like a big deal, but when you shoot it through a gun at people, he had his whole, he, he lost eyesight in one eye and had his whole face shattered. And there were, I mean, there, there, there were life-threatening injuries to multiple people uh, from the weapons that law enforcement were using. And when you think about all the funding that Morton County poured into protecting that pipeline, but also the state of North Dakota, which at the time, the governor at the time in 2016, declared it a national emergency, called in the National Guard. Again, these were, this was a peaceful movement to protect not just treaty rights and drinking water, but also burial sites. There were um, 27 burials that the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, former Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, pointed out in a filing he filed with the Federal District Court. And Dakota Access um, brought out bulldozers to bulldoze those burial sites on that Labor Day, Saturday of, of 2016. And, and here, all this law enforcement money is being poured into protecting that pipeline, which is doing very violent, dangerous things that are unlawful, in a state where we have, you know, rates of human trafficking of Native women and children that are off the charts in Western North Dakota because of the Bakken oil boom, uh, because of the man camps, because of the hundreds of thousands of men who do not live in North Dakota otherwise that are merely at the man camps to work on the, in the oil fields. And you just think about the misallocation of resources uh, from the state perspective um, and, and really, who should law enforcement be focused on, right? And, um, and then, thankfully, a case like this where the Eighth Circuit maybe got some things wrong, but got some things right, and is actually allowing some of the constitutional challenges that um, Mr. Mitchell has brought against law enforcement because they violated his constitutional rights. And that case is allowing to, is allowing, you know, being allowed to go forward thanks to the Eighth Circuit's decision today. But I just was thinking about that because it, I was thinking about that case as I was reading it today and just this idea of, yeah, we've got this crisis of Native women and children who are going missing and are murdered, and we're still, you know, as a, um, if you look at the state, spending way more money on protecting pipelines than some human lives. Yes. <clears throat> uh, that's a revolutionary thought, you know, that the law could have some relationship to justice. How about that? <laughs> right. Uh, and also to empower us as individuals, there's the question of what energy we are using, what energy our apartment building, our community, our street cleaners, our, you know, whatever it is, uh, are using, and what influence we can have on that, which is quite remarkable. Uh, just organizing your neighbors, you know, can have a huge, huge influence. Uh, and it is satisfying, <laughs> you know, you get to know each other, you get to feel effective, uh, I recommend it. Wow, <laughs> I love this conversation. I could do this all night. Um, I, I have a question from a person in the audience and I, I want to just give an opportunity if they themselves would like to stand and ask the question, if not, 
just do nothing and I'll continue with the question, but it was about um, the Caribbean and colonization beginning there. Go ahead. Oh, of course. Well, I mean, it didn't, didn't Columbus wrongly think that he was in the Caribbean in the first place? Yes. Well, that's what sparked the question. Yeah. Such a terrible navigator. <laughs> he was really bad. Colonialism wherever it exists. Yes, right. Okay. Uh, so I wrote, uh, as a Caribbean indigenous person, I'm Taino, um, I am grateful that you mentioned that, the, that colonization began in the Caribbean because many people uh, kind of skipped that part, right? Um, and that the first MMIW were Caribbean indigenous women, were Taino women in the islands of what is now Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, or in Cuba. Um, so my question is, what issues or risks do you see happen when we don't include other indigenous communities on, on this continent in this com these kind of conversations of um, that when we're talking about MMIW. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think there's nothing that stops us from including indigenous people everywhere. I mean, the southern tip of India, Kerala, uh, is the oldest, uh, still the most well-educated to this day. Uh, you know, I mean, whatever continent we look at, it's important to include the earliest and indigenous uh, organizations, civilizations that, in, for the most part, are still there. I mean, one thing I will point out, right, is so so a lot of the times when we do the work in federal reform, and I think this is such a valid question, I'm so glad you raised it. Um, is that we work from a sovereignty framework, right? And so what we think about is we have 574 federally recognized tribes, and the, the native people of those tribes, right, have, uh, as MK stated, a, a trust relationship, right, which is actually a legal doctrine, um, with the United States government. And some of that is based on the 400 and over 440 treaties that the US entered into with tribes, and some of it is based, right, and enshrined in US Supreme Court law. So when we add that context and we think about that work, right, that's the framework that we operate from a lot of the time is just that sovereignty framework. And you're right, it leaves out global indigenous or other indigenous populations, including other indigenous populations in the US. But it is important to, to make the distinction because it is a legal relationship that the federal government has with US tribes. And we believe, right, that that is important for the safety of native women within the context of those 574. And that's relevant. Um, and you can look at Hawaii right now, right? They're going through a similar conversation about sovereignty and they've been going through a sovereignty movement conversation for a long time, right? And there are people on both sides of the argument. There are native Hawaiians who will say, we do want to enjoy, right, enjoy, I'm putting that, that's not the word I would use, but we want to have the alleged relationship the tribes have with the federal government and be considered in that way, in that legal way. And then there's another group that says, we just want you to leave. Like, this is actually factually ours, right? Uh, we didn't become a state until the 1950s, right? Hawaii didn't. And we want you to go. And I would imagine if you talk to people in Puerto Rico, maybe some Taino people too, right? They might have a similar conversation. So it's also thinking about movement building and where people are in the space with movement building. Because sometimes, right? people don't want to have that relationship with the federal government. So I do think it's relevant. But in terms of talking about MMIW just sort of on a global issue, I think it's important to remember that. I mean, you're right. Columbus actually didn't set foot in what was the lower 48. He, he, he was never here. Uh, and it's interesting that we kind of, you know, he's been glorified in a, in a way for, as everybody mentioned, his really bad navigation skills. And also for the fact that he was a genocidal maniac. I mean, it's not even that he, right, just wasn't ever here and we like to enjoy this myth about him being here. It's that he, he chopped off people's hands and feet for not bringing him the gold that he thought was in Puerto Rico, right? Uh, he was a violent, violent colonizer. Um, and yet, you know, he's just memorialized, right? Pretty much everywhere we go. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered it. Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Okay. I was just going to say, too, um, I like, oh, can't stand him. He's my nemesis. So I concur 
with everything that was said. But also I think it's important to include it on that global context because we don't want to lead, we don't want to contribute to the erasure that has already been part of us. So we, it's so important to talk about it on that global level. And honestly, what is the fascination with Columbus? Can someone tell me? Because I don't know what it is. I don't get it. Like, I don't get it. Oh my God, he was so bad. <laughs> that was all. Do we have time for another question? One more question? Okay. All right, so the last question is, well, first the, the participant said to thank you so much for being here and, and sharing with us. And the question is about uh, MMIP across borders and particularly the border between two or more colonizing governments. So many immigrants are arriving at borders and they're displaced and dispossessed indigenous people in addition to being migrants. So I just want to throw that out to anyone who has any thoughts on the immigration, migrant crises, so-called crises, and this particular crisis. Well, I don't feel um, expert enough to address the crises. Other people will do that. But I just want to address the advantages and what we're missing by not connecting uh, our, our lost, most of us were lost, <laughs> lost our history to our indigenous original selves. I remember sitting with women in the Kalahari Desert who showed me plants they used for uh, fertility, for other things. It's an incredibly sophisticated uh, and important healing uh, knowledge that, that we are missing because of not having these connections. Migrant crisis, <laughs> connections to MMIP crisis. Any thoughts? This is, this is a very complicated question. Um, and it's wrought right with misunderstandings, I think, in general. So I want to just throw that out as a giant disclaimer. And I know that's not a good CYA. But what I think is really relevant is your point about erasure. Um, and I feel like this sometimes in academia, right? And I do a little, I like teach a random class at the University of Miami. And sometimes I, I, I run into questions or just like generally, not like there, but about, you know, well, what about transnational issues? Or what about uh, global indigenous populations? Or what about these crises around our borders, right? And how is that? And it's kind of like, you know, at some point too, right, American exceptionalism comes into play and our like, it's almost like an imperialist, it, like we're just so trained to think like that. Like, well, there's other spaces as well where these problems are happening too. And yeah, there are, and we absolutely have to acknowledge that. That, that's, that is a million percent valid. I mean, nobody could say otherwise. But in the US where we have the legal system that we have, where we have the police states that we have, where we have the specific US state violence that we have, where we have specific forms of colonization by tribe, right? That's relevant, I think. And I, I think it gets lost. And, and, and then what the ask actually becomes is, think about your own self in relation to what we're talking about and your own positionality, right? Because if you're envisioning and this is not what the question is getting at, I realize. But if you're envisioning, like, well, you know, as an American, you know, I don't need to think about what's going on here. I'll just think about what's going on in Guatemala, or I'll just think about what's going on in Nicaragua, or I'll think about what's going on in Brazil, right? Those are all very important things to be thinking about. At the same time, there, you benefit from being here, like in this place, on this land. You benefit from the removal of native people here. You benefit from us losing all of our land. We, there's a benefit, right, from people removing us out west. There was a benefit from when they took tribe sovereign status in the 50s, right? And all of these like individual acts of state violence is privilege to a lot of people. And that's, like, we cannot lose that in the conversation. And so it's important. It's actually very related, I think, specifically to the question earlier, too. And I, 
but is it, it is a global crisis. And there are places, right, where these are ongoing issues. We have to think about how those colonizing governments are impacting that space too. And thinking about, well, and we love to throw out this word decolonization all the time. I'm not exactly, <laughs> it's like, well, what is that? I don't know what that means. Um, and I think we actually have to start thinking about what does an indigenous futures look like in each of the spaces that we're in and are we willing to do it? Um, but I think to like meld us all kind of together in a way sort of violently strips us from individual experiences of violence and I don't think that should get lost in this conversation. I got nothing. Got anything? No, you did it. It was good. Should I do my interpretive dance? I'm yes. kidding. Yes. <laughs> it's all do one. Everybody stand. No, just kidding. <laughs> Any other questions from our audience members? There are some questions. Okay. Can we can we directly ask people, ask folks? Okay. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad that you asked and that you noticed. Yeah. You know. <laughs> there is. Yeah, MMIW, uh, for, uh, the movement, um, the color, just it's just the symbolization of the movement, basically. So like even domestic violence awareness, right? We have purple. Uh, boarding schools is orange in September. Um, and then MMIW has been red. And the, the National Day of Awareness is May 5th, just so that you all know, too. I think right back in the middle. Oh. <laughs> Only because I haven't figured out how you talk about it with kids. I don't do well with little kids. So I don't know, I don't know of any resources. Do you know I of have any? them. Yeah, there's a, yeah. so talk for about. really young kids, yeah. there is, um, there are a bunch of really great boarding school books. Uh, so like when we were still young, I think. Oh, I think there's one too about like, you. Has, um, oh my God, there's another one. I just read it too. Every time I read, try to read it to I accidentally children, lied. I knew about that. I just watched them in my tears. Um, oh my God. <laughs> there's, there's a, I think there's a couple of good books about boarding schools. So I would, I would look there first. Um, the Birch Bark series uh, that Louise Erdrich did, it's kind of like a, a has anyone read that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Some people have read it. It's like a take on, um, what is the series that it, it's a take on? I cannot remember. Little House on the Prairie. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sort of like an indigenized version of that. Um, Illuminative, I think, has really good resources. We have some for good you. recommendations out yeah. there. There's good col like people have been making during the pandemic a bunch of coloring books for for kids that I think are relatively educational. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. The age group is hard. Yeah, I think it's always a good lesson. I know I'm talking a lot. I'm sorry. I think it's always a good lesson to say whose land are we on, right? And then just do a little exploring. Right? Who's land, what are the important places in our community that maybe honor Native people? What can we learn from those spaces? Um, what, are, um, what do Native people from the land that we exist on say right, about themselves? What do other people say about them? You can kind of do like some comparing between different age groups. And I love creation stories. Um, I use creation stories in my college class, but I also use them with my own children. I think that they teach us something really innate about different worldviews, where you get like a solid, a solid, you know, distinction between them. I mean, you can think about the Haudenosaunee creation story of Sky Woman, and then you can compare it to biblical creation stories. You can see different themes emerge in both, and different worldviews that emerge in both. And I mean, I have a six and a nine-year-old at home, and. I think one of the most important things is not necessarily to keep them or shield them from the real relevant history that we all need to be learning, but that also affects the present day. And, you know, around Thanksgiving or Indigenous People's Day, I won't even say the name that we call it right now. Why, mommy, why are you calling it Indigenous People's Day? 
and not necessarily giving them the full-on version of events, but not hiding it either, because I think the more we normalize our history and how it affects our present, the better citizens we're going to be raising. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's Native 360, you said? Native Knowledge 360. Thank you. And the gentleman in the blue? You know, thank you so much, because I thought that that was Joel's card that he accidentally gave me, and that he had made this announcement before I came onto the stage, so I'm glad that you did that. <laughs> In the black. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. that was yes, thank you. So. Uh, Housing to me is one of the best places to put our energy in terms of prevention. Um, when people are safely housed, right, they're much less vulnerable to these types of issues. And that's just true across the board, not even just for indigenous people, right? I mean, most of our communities right now are experiencing an absolute crisis around homelessness. Um, and so uh, at the organization I work at, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, we um, launched a new initiative, which is the Indigenous Safe Housing Center that's prioritizing addressing the intersection of domestic violence and other forms of gender-based violence with housing instability and homelessness and also climate change um, and the other things that are impacting those, you know, that intersection specifically. Um, how do I think that it inter interacts with the MMIP issue? I, I really just think that when, when we do not feel like people belong, which is what we say when we say somebody doesn't deserve housing, right? Um, we say you're not worthy of this thing. That's actually a, a basic human right, right? Just, just by virtue of being a person. Um, but when we tell a person in our community that they don't belong because they're not meeting the conditions of whatever we've attached to housing, right? Um, we're not just telling them that, we're telling other people that. This person is devalued. And that devalue, devaluing of them actually begets violence in a lot of ways. And we know, for example, that like most sexual assault survivors, or most homeless women, for example, are also sexual assault survivors. And we know that domestic violence leads to homelessness a lot for women. Uh, we, there, so there's a ton of statistics about how these two things are related. But to me, like, it's, it's also a mindset thing. It's, it's w why do we believe that housing is conditional? I mean, wh why do we believe that food is conditional? Why do we believe that water is conditional? Right? I mean, I, these are things that people just should have an inherent right to. So I'm glad, thank you so much for that question. But that's how they intersect, so. So I have to be the bearer of bad news and end our conversation, but I just want to extend and hope all of you would extend an applause for all of our speakers tonight. That was great, you guys. You haven't been getting out like I haven't been getting out, <laughs> I can tell. Um, yes, and the Lenape Center, we are Nechusak. We work on this issue. If you want to act and really support 
uh, this work, you can also do that through supporting Lenape Center. So thank you all for coming and I'll turn it back over to Linda. You have, oh, okay. Well, well thank you all. Um, it's been great to have you here. We appreciate you participating in general, but in particular at this particular evening. Um, and I think everyone found it fascinating and we're thrilled to see so many people here and so deeply interested in the work that you're doing. So many thanks.